first, I really like this Menti uh, survey tool. So if everybody can play along with me and scan that QR code for the last time, I have a few questions. In a previous life, I was a market researcher and I did a ton of uh, you know, focus groups and surveys. So this is just amazing and fascinating to me. Um, what do I do up here? Okay. So I'll give a five, four. Okay, so I'll just keep going then. Hold on. Love to have a yes or no answer to this. Does a poorly shucked oyster influence your perception of the oyster's quality? Now think about this from a perspective of you as an oyster consumer. Oh good, I'm talking to my people here. <laughs> All right, and by the way, show of hands, who was in my sensory workshop a couple days ago? <gasps> yeah, All right, great, glad to hear that. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving on. Now this is a, sorry, a, a bit of a long list, but I guess on your phone, you'll be able to see it more clearly. Rank these in order of importance in what you consider to be a great oyster program. So things like good selection of oyster varieties, price, availability of oyster happy hour, oyster shucking quality, raw bar design, display, having a raw bar kind of in the front of the restaurant, and then variety of Sources and was it? Oh, sauces, sauces and toppings. Okay, really interesting. So in the front, we got knowledgeable staff, and then uh, the selection of oysters are kind of neck and neck right now for great oyster program. The shucking is slowly creeping up. It's like a horse race. It's fun. Now. The knowledge is uh, creeping up a little bit. I'm gonna give one more, uh, 10 seconds. Okay, really interesting, right? I'm not sure if everybody has seen, I, I don't think I've ever done this kind of survey. I've just seen, talked to people anecdotally, so it's really interesting to see that a knowledgeable staff is at the very top of what you would consider um, to be a maybe a requirement or a key indicator of a great oyster program, followed by oyster shucking quality and then the selection of oysters. Finally, with a variety of sauces and toppings at the very end. So finally, um, this is very quick, but if you can name a restaurant or raw bar that you believe does an outstanding job of showcasing oysters, uh, that would be great. It could be anywhere in the world. This is cool. I actually don't. I, I'm not. I'm not recognizing some of these, which is really fun. I'm gonna add these to my list of two goes now. Okay, Kim, a lot of people saying Kimball House. I'm not gonna give my answer not to bias anyone. <laughs> That's very fun. I'll give a, a five more seconds here so we can move on. Okay, I'm gonna keep going, but please keep uh, filling your answers. This is awesome. So thank you so much for playing along. So I wanted to talk a bit about oyster stewardship. And I know that for some of you, oyster stewardship means, as a grower, being able to carry that product from a seed to a, a market size with a great amount of care. That is not what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk about the other side of that equation, which is after that oyster leaves the farm and the distribution center, going into the restaurant, what happens? 
This is just a picture of me and some of our Oyster Master Guild members in Philadelphia. We realized that there was a whole bunch of members in Philly, so we decided to meet up a few weeks ago at Oyster House, great oyster uh, bar in the center of Philly. Uh, make sure you bookmark that, because that's amazing. We did a six variety tasting around the Atlantic and Pacific coast. And in that group, half of us, uh, half of them are professionals. So they are professional oyster caterers, oyster shuckers. And then the others are incredible enthusiasts and bin supporters. You've probably either recognized their faces or maybe their social media handles. You have Emily the Oyster Girl, uh, G Shucks, Gary McCready, who is the master shucker at Oyster House. You have Greg, uh, the OG SF Oyster Nerd blog. Um, and then Rutvik from Red Oyster, a catering company, and other new members around Philly. And it was just a lot of fun to be able to gather this community who really celebrates the oysters uh, in their best form. Uh, as some of you know, I co-founded Oyster Master Guild officially uh, last year, but this idea has been in my head percolating for maybe the last seven years, or eight years even, Bill and Beth knew of my, my dream really early on. I think we had a chat about it over a brunch one day, and it's finally kind of come to fruition. What I think I discovered along the way of blogging about oysters for In a Half Shell is that, you know, even though the most incredible oysters are being produced right now, um, it's actually very difficult to find them in the perfect uh, condition and presentation out in a raw bar. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, and New York has a ton of oyster bars, and I actually struggle to say where I can get a consistently well-shucked plate of oysters. And that's kind of sad. Um, one of the important things I want to point out is that you know, oysters require an incredible network of trust. It really requires trust on the part of the consumer believing in a safe and responsible supply chain, and then also all the key players along the way to be able to make sure everybody is doing their jobs right. And so this is why we are here talking about oyster storytelling and learning about what everybody is doing and what they're researching and kind of innovating. I think that uh, this trust is also created also by building the relationships and maybe even on a formal level, the certifications or compliance to regulatory um, requirements and being consistent and accountable for what you put out in the world. I think what I realized like, in the raw bar is that last point of contact can sometimes betray the rest of the journey. And by that, I mean that craft oysters are kind of wasted in careless hands. And the reality is like most of you in this room really care a great deal, but outside of this room, in like the big restaurants or the big seafood chains who do serve oysters, they don't necessarily know or care about the quality of the presentation of the oyster. And in turn, uh, you get a lot of massacred oysters and people not knowing what they're selling and then turning off kind of new beginners to oysters. That's incredibly frustrating to me, especially when there's so many years being spent working on perfecting these oysters, that shouldn't be the case. So what are we to do about it? Um, so I think like maybe five or six years ago, I started adding, I, I started doing workshops and tastings uh, in New York and wherever I could you know, find a space. And I positioned myself as an oyster sommelier. And people would ask me like, I can't believe that's a thing. Can, like, how do you become one? And I was just telling them, well, I don't know. I guess I, I just ate a lot of oysters and <laughs> started asking really annoying questions to the chefs. They had no answer for me. They sent me to their distributors. They didn't have an answer either, so they sent me finally to the farms, and that's where the magic happened. When I went to the oyster farms, that's when everything sort of made sense. Um, so from that day, I was like, well, it, can oyster stewardship be a thing? And the answer is yes, because all of us in this room are oyster stewards to some degree. However, it's not really, a, uh, it's not really an identity that is recognized in the industry right now. I put this out there, like oyster steward isn't a job necessarily, but it's a hat that we all wear. 
So I think what we have talked about a lot uh, over the course of this last two days is that education is definitely needed. However, I also would say education isn't enough. You need to educate educators. You need to create more educators so that they can create more educators so that they can educate the masses because the one-to-one -one relationship or even the one-to-hundred relationship isn't going to be enough for us to make the cultural change. Um, a lot of other commodity uh, products, especially in food, have already picked up on this. Wine is the perfect example, right? You have thousands and thousands of producers, all producing kind of varying degrees of the same fermented grape juice that we all love and enjoy. They have incredible uh, system of educators and education in place. Same with specialty coffee, which I found to be inc has incredible resources around recognizing coffee experts. So I think what OMG is trying to do is to be able to identify an identity for these oyster stewards in the marketplace and to be able to create a pathway of becoming an oyster steward in the form of a certified uh, ambassador, a certified then a certified specialist to a certified oyster shucker or certified oyster som, and finally at the ultimate level, you're a master oyster sommelier or a master oyster shucker. To be a master, our requirement is that you have to give back. You can't just hoard this knowledge in your own little brain and you have to be able to demonstrate that you are giving back your knowledge to the next generation. Uh, this, is the, this is a pathway that is part of our education and certification program, and the vision is to be able to create this identity and this community of oyster stewards around the world, which would be really cool, so that I won't have to eat crappy shucked oysters anymore. <laughs> so, the education, certification, networking, and marketplace. The marketplace and network is where this is our phase two. Once you have a pool of these educators and you identify them, how do we make them recognizable in the industry? Here, we know who has which restaurant, um, you know, chefs and producers building relationship, that's great, but chefs are really busy and chefs aren't necessarily the ones shucking the oysters in the restaurants. So how do you create the recognition for the people who are touching your oysters last? And that is where we endeavor, hopefully, to have kind of like the James Beard or Michelin version of oyster stewards and oyster service people, having those awards in place that recognize those individuals the same way that you recognize chefs. And then also be able to connect those people to opportunities. So a lot of catering, events, places where um, if you're just starting out, maybe you can get a little more practice shucking at events for cooked oysters. Landlocked is a great example. You know, you need so many oysters shucked, like we can actually bring in a, a network of people who want that practice and exposure. That would be cool. So my vision uh, for oyster stewardship, maybe in the next five or 10 years, would be going from getting a plate from that looks kind of like the left to the one that looks like on the right in anywhere you go or at least anywhere that uh, supports, uh, supports individuals who are certified and have that in, uh, education in OMG. So that's it. <laughs> Oh, if you do want to reach out, if you are a grower, I would love to connect because we always uh, want to share that knowledge. You can find me on Instagram. I don't have a business card, I'm sorry. Oyster Master Guild, I think it was up there in a recent, in a previous panel, that's how. Thanks, Julie. Any questions for Julie? All right, well, I know I took the course and so I recommend it. I, uh, I enjoyed taking the course quite a much, quite a, quite a bit. All right, thank you, Julie. Okay.